Hello? Are you gonna work here or what? I'm already so aggravated with this. Well, through various trials and tribulations, here we are uh, back again with AP, I mean, regular world history. Um, what's going on now? Is this working? What am I doing? Is this... Okay, good. All right. I updated grades. You may have noticed that um, on Wednesday, I put in everything that you had done to that point. So your grade should be updated. Um, let's see. This is really challenging because I don't have... Um, I don't have the materials that I normally would to use. Um, let me see if I can find. I may have an old PowerPoint from the Cold War on my computer here. Let me see if I can pull it up really quickly. It's actually not on my computer. It'll be on Schoology, but it's going to be an old one. It's not going to be. I don't think it's going to be the right one. So that's where we're headed next is the Cold War. Finished with World War Two now. not my day for technology today folks yeah this isn't the right PowerPoint but I'm just gonna have to use this one it is what it is Okay, we're going to skip past all this. This isn't even my PowerPoint. This is somebody else's that I just happen to have. I have a much better one than this one, but whatever. Um, okay, so the Cold War. Basically, after World War... Actually, let me turn this down. After World War II, the United States and the Soviet Union, uh, as the two dominant enemy superpowers who became engaged in this global competition with one another over what would be the future of rebuilding Europe in the image of the United States being a capitalist style economy, democratic style government, or in the image of the Soviet Union, which would be a communist style government and a command style economy. So they're competing with one another initially over uh, who gets to rebuild what. And they divide the territories up and decide to start rebuilding places in their image. I often describe the Cold War as being between two different axes. One is a north-south axis, 
One is a west-east axis. In other words, you have the west, the United States, democratic, capitalist, free market style economy, the style of life that all of us are living today, or uh, or the style of Eastern communism. And, um, and so that's one axis is along west or east. But there's another axis that's going on as well, and that's decolonization. So there's a north-south axis as well. And the trade winds of the west-east axis have a tendency to sweep up other nations in the global relationships between north and south. In other words, when we're talking about um, Europe and its its uh, colonies in Africa, in South America, in Southeast Asia, and various places across the globe, a lot of them are now breaking away from European dominance. Then the question is, when they break away between the West and the East, who are they going to be influenced by more? They get caught up in the in the winds of the Cold War because the winds of the Cold War are very, very, very strong prevailing winds that sweep up these nations who are who are really just trying to establish their independence. They don't even really want to be swept up with either side. But what you'll find is those nations that try to carve a path for themselves without getting swept up either by America or by the Soviet Union, they find themselves usually adrift meaning that they then alienate themselves from both sides. Neither side trusts them, and they end up getting no aid from anyone. So there's this whole decolonization process where these nations are trying to break away from colonial control, and they have a tendency to get swept up in what goes on. Best example, obviously, is going to be Vietnam. So Vietnam uh, had been under French colonial control. And eventually, of course, they start to exact independence movements under the leadership of a guy named Ho Chi Minh. Ho Chi Minh was a communist um, and initially received support from the Soviet Union. But then, of course, the United States got involved because they were worried that the Soviet Union's uh, spread of communism had already moved to China and was now moving to Vietnam and could potentially move to other places in Southeast Asia. And before you know it, you'd have an entire Asian continent that was completely communist. That was a big fear of the United States was the spread of communism at that time. And so uh, Vietnam gets engaged or swept up in the trade winds of the East-West conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union. And there's a giant war that happens there between uh, the United States and Vietnam in order to try to prevent that country from falling into the hands of the communists, which fails because we fought for about 14 years or so in Vietnam to attempt to prevent Vietnam from falling to communism, but it falls anyway. Now, today, Vietnam is still technically communist. Uh, there is still single party rule in Vietnam, but to be honest with you, in terms of, of, of uh, freedom of the economy, it might be one of the most laissez-faire places on the planet. Oddly enough, um, market capital, free market capitalism has basically completely taken hold in a lot of places in Asia where, I mean, there are virtually no restrictions on businesses and very, very few regulatory practices and stuff. So it's uh, it's kind of interesting to see how um, even in a communist, quote unquote, nation like Vietnam, uh, how far they are removed from the initial vision of Karl Marx's communism as outlined in the Communist Manifesto. So the Cold War was a diplomatic crisis. It's not an actual physical war where the United States and Soviet Union sent troops to invade each other's nations, fortunately, because um, we're now in a nuclear era. So uh, if it had actually, which by the way, it dang near came close a couple of times uh, to resulting in, in all-out nuclear conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union, and we could be living in a really bizarre alternate reality had, had that, that actually, actually happened, happened in the 60s, uh, 20, 20 years before I was even born. 
So the Cold War was a diplomatic crisis which occurred between the United States and its Western Bloc and the United and the uh, Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. That's what USSR stands for, Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, and its Eastern Bloc. And so when we say bloc there, we're talking about the nations within Europe that are supported by the United States. That's going to be places like West Germany. Um, because now Germany is fragmented because, remember, they split the German possessions between the Allied powers after the war ends and they defeat Germany. And then uh, France, Britain, um, Spain, Portugal, all of those are considered part of the Western Bloc. And then the Eastern Bloc would be pretty much anywhere in Eastern Europe. That's going to be Hungary, Romania, Bosnia, Croatia, well, actually, Yugoslavia at that time. Technically, Yugoslavia is an independent communist nation. It's not under the influence of the Soviet Union, but it is still communist and thus falls under the Eastern Bloc. And then you've got other places too, Poland, East Germany, and then Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, and so on. All of those are going to be falling under the Eastern Bloc, Belarus, Moldova, etc., the Cold War was uh, resulted from a variety of disagreements and problems which surfaced right at the end of World War II. So if we talk about the roots of the Cold War, um, as you guys already know, because I talked about this on Monday before you guys took your online practice test for uh, World War II, this, um, well, not practice test, I, guess I call it a practice test because it's not a real test, but whatever. Anyway, they have a number of these conferences, and it's clear from the get-go, even if you look at the body language here, right, um, these, these three allied powers coming together for the purposes of putting Germany down in World War II are not going to remain best buds after the war. Um, Joseph Stalin had made promises, but you have to understand Joseph Stalin's view is informed by Russia's experiences both in World War I and World War II. So it's hard for Russia to sympathize with any of the complaints of the United States of Russia because... The United States didn't have to take the full force of the German military for months and months and months on end, um, both in World War One and World War Two, years on end, and then lose 25 million people. So, so Russia is extremely skeptical about Germany now in the grand scheme of things, and it has no interest in giving Germany any slack after the war. So the Allies, including Stalin, had initially allowed people to create, had initially agreed to allow the people to create free democratic institutions of their own choice. And the question is, is Joseph Stalin going to keep up with his promise or is he going to break it? And at the Potsdam conference, as we talked about, he breaks it. He wants a buffer zone between Germany and the USSR for protection against a future war because Russia is really, really, really... Um, threatened by the by the prospect of a, of a world war three in the future so it wants to protect itself plus two russia had been trying to had been trying to increase its land holdings for a long time and so this is a great opportunity since their military has already uh, physically marched through all of eastern europe as they were battling against the germans to push the germans back into germany the front line was moving closer and closer and closer to Germany. And as they're doing that, the Russian troops are occupying the zones that they that they are marching over. And now their military is situated in these places. And Stalin says, we're going to keep our military there because we need this buffer zone. We need this, this chunk of land. <laughs> Excuse me. Between Germany and the USSR to protect ourselves for protection. Almost like a bumper on your car. Okay, so the Soviet point of view is that democracies had always been hostile towards communism and the Soviet Union. Um, there was a project called the Archangel Expedition during World War I, uh, which the U.S. Uh, US uh, military didn't even technically recognize until 1933. And the United States and Britain didn't even open up a Western Front in Europe to help the Soviets out until June of 1944, about 11 months before the end of the war. And during that time, millions of Soviet soldiers lost their lives. So the Soviet point of view, um, it, you know, is that, uh, you know, look, have some compassion on the fact that, uh, you know, you guys have never treated the Soviet Union fair. We've always got treated as a second or third rate country. Um, you've never respected our own our governmental policies and domestic 
economic policies and stuff like that. And the United States and Britain also had frozen Russia out of the atomic bomb project. Now, they got spies in there, so they were able to get that technology a lot faster than the United States had intended. But the United States terminated the Lend-Lease to Moscow in May of 45, but gave Britain aid until 1946. So there's definitely favoritism amongst the United States and Britain. Uh, the, you know, the United States is, has favoritism towards Britain and other Western allies that are democratic and capitalist before they have um, to Russia. So um, Soviets were seeking this buffer zone, particularly in Poland. Now, the United States point of view, of course, is that Stalin is trying to take places over. They view Stalin as being overly aggressive as uh, and the United States is extremely concerned that um, that communism is going to spread. There was a theory called domino theory that said that once you once you see communism break out in a particular place, that the it's only a matter of time before the other places around it start falling like dominoes. And so, um, so you know, China, for example, falls to communism, and then. Uh, Vietnam starts falling to communism and North Korea falls to communism. So this is, these are these are the concerns that uh, that Americans have at this time. Um, so they said Stalin's trying to create spheres of influence in Eastern Europe. Stalin had already broken the pledges he he had promised at Yalta previously. Refusing, refusing to allow the reunification of Germany and insisting that Germany remain split up into minimally two territories, West and East Germany, which, by the way, when I was a kid, it was still West and East Germany. When I was born, there was still a West Germany and an East Germany going all the way back to the end of World War II. They didn't reunify Germany into a single German state until 1989 when I was in kindergarten. In fact, in terms of teaching history, the content where in my life, I, the first thing that I remember about the things that we teach is the reunification of Germany. My mom sat me down in front of the television and said, Tim, you got to watch this. This is an important thing happening right now. And it was the Berlin Wall coming down. And, um, and that signaled the reunification of Germany in, in 1989. So, um, Anyhow, Winston Churchill's Iron Curtain speech. Now, we need to be clear about something because for whatever reason, kids seem to get confused about this. When I say Iron Curtain, I'm not talking about the Berlin Wall. They're two totally different things. The Iron Curtain speech is made 15 years before the Berlin Wall was even thought about being constructed. So, um, so the Iron Curtain speech is a metaphorical curtain. There's not literally an Iron Curtain that was built across Europe, okay? It's metaphorical. There's no literal barrier that separates Western Europe from Eastern Europe. The only barrier that we really see, physical barrier that we see built during this time is the Berlin Wall. But the Berlin Wall is only in Berlin. And it's only around the Soviet sector of Berlin to wall in their own people from escaping over to the western side of Berlin, which was controlled by the United States and um, the Western powers. So the United States wanted democracy spread throughout the world with strong international organization to maintain global peace. And they view the Soviet Union as an obstacle to that. Now, the Iron Curtain speech set was something like this. Basically, Churchill gave this speech at, a, at Westminster College in Fulton, Missouri on March 5th, 1946. By this point, Winston Churchill was no longer uh, the Prime Minister of Britain, although he does get re-elected Prime Minister later on, but only serves for a short time. He was a better wartime Prime Minister than... Uh, than peacetime prime minister. But anyway, here's his Iron Curtain speech from Stettin, which is a city along the Baltic Sea in northern Europe, to Trieste, which is in the southern part of Europe in the Adriatic Sea. An Iron Curtain has descended across the continent. Behind that line lie all the capitals of the ancient states of Central and Eastern Europe. Warsaw, Berlin, Prague, Vienna, Budapest, Belgrade, Bucharest, and Sofia 
all these famous cities and the populations around them lie in what I must call the Soviet sphere, and all are subject in one form or another not only to Soviet influence, but to a very high and in some cases increasing measure of control from Moscow. So this is a, this is a concerned Winston Churchill who does not trust Stalin at all uh, after World War II to uh, liberate these places. He believes that this is a giant power grab by the Soviet Union that is on par or maybe even worse than uh, the German power grab that was made for Poland in the years leading up to World War II. So the Iron Curtain speech is about signifying the, the idea that Europe is becoming divided into a Western sphere and an Eastern sphere, and that the Soviet Union's domination under Stalinist uh, communist government of, of the Soviet Union uh, falls behind the Iron Curtain. Why does he call it the Iron Curtain? Well... The, uh, if you think about Stalin, Stalin literally means man of steel. And he had held a series of unfair elections and coups to install communist puppet governments in most of these European, East, Eastern European nations like Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Bulgaria, Romania, Yugoslavia. All of these nations are communist nations now that... Um, the, and remember, Czechoslovakia, it's so sad. They had had a history of democracy in Czechoslovakia, but they are nothing compared to the Soviet Union in terms of power. So they can't defend themselves. They're victims uh, of, of, of being taken over, essentially, and made into puppet states by the Soviet Union now that the world, uh, Second World War is, is over. So the Iron Curtain represents this kind of um, veil of secrecy uh, the idea that, that, that what goes on in these Eastern European states under the influence of Stalin is really only known to Stalin and his immediate inner circle. Um, there was a lot of secrecy. There was a lot of, of um, blocking out of influence and intimidation used by the Soviet Union to prevent the West from really having a grasp on what was happening in the Eastern sphere under Soviet rule because the last thing that we need to have happen immediately after World War II is to have the United States and Britain now turn on the Soviet Union and engage in a brand new World War III that would most certainly have resulted in global destruction. So the Iron Curtain is kind of this um, metaphorical boundary that separates West and Eastern Europe, but it's also metaphorical in the sense not just because of the ideological differences between Western and Eastern Europe, but also because of the level of secrecy uh, that, that was conducted or uh, deliberately set up uh, by the Soviet Union during that time, where it was very difficult to fully understand what was happening behind, those, behind that line because if the United States or Britain would have gone in and interfered militarily in those areas, um, it would have provoked Russia into confrontation and potentially war. So um, here you can see kind of where he's talking about here uh, in terms of the Iron Curtain. This is, a, again, a metaphorical boundary. This isn't an actual wall or anything like that. Now, how come, Soviet, how come Yugoslavia, which is communist, is not technically behind the Iron Curtain? Well, you really could, quite honestly, draw that line right about here. Okay, The further east that you went, Austria was technically a Western European state, but it got hairy. The closer you got to this boundary here, the, it, the more concerning uh, it was to um to the west and of course you know this represents too like this this um this line represents these lands that the soviet union controls now i mean these are not technically states that are supposed to be the soviet these are independent nations or at least they're supposed to be and the Soviet Union has created this buffer zone to prevent a future, quote unquote, prevent a future Western German provocation. But really, it's probably largely, uh, you know, about a land grab. Yugoslavia is communist. So it would not have probably been a, a safe place for a Westerner to go for a long time. But Yugoslavia has their own communist leader, and his name is Josep, J-O-S-E-P, Josep Tito. 
T-I-T-O. Josip Tito um, was a communist ruler uh, who managed quite successfully for some time to be able to navigate a kind of a middle road between um, communism of the Soviet form and communism of an independent form. But uh, suffice it to say that Yugoslavia likely would have been much closer in its ties to the Soviet Union than to the West. And then you've got all the Western European nations over on the on the left side of your screen there. That's going to be Spain, Portugal. Really, you know, Spain is kind of a, a neutral one because Spain has uh, still Francisco Franco is in power in Spain still. They're kind of a nationalist nightmare in Spain. There's It's anarchical at times. There, it's... Uh, Spain's kind of a mess for a while there, but but Portugal, France, Italy, West Germany. Like I said, Austria is kind of the same as Spain. the The closer you get to the the boundary in Austria, uh, the the more concerning it probably gets. But certainly, West Germany and all the Low Countries, Luxembourg, Belgium, Netherlands, Denmark, all of them remain um, Western nations. NATO stands for North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Uh, this was established in the early 50s, mid 50s. Uh, uh, and NATO was a, a defensive alliance that was basically like, um, you know, if you saw a big group of intimidating gentlemen walk into a, you know, nightclub or something like that, it's like, it's like basically an, a defensive alliance that was deliberately provocative and they're not, they're not intentionally going around and throwing the first punch, but they're, they're, NATO is kind of like the equivalent of like, yo, if you mess with one of my bros, all my bros are going to hop in and, and mess you up, bro, like that sort of thing. And so um, NATO becomes very, very, very provocative to Russia. So they respond with their own defensive clique, if you will, called the Warsaw Pact, which, of course, was made up of all of the nations that they had already taken over anyway. So when we say that the Warsaw Pact involved Poland, East Germany, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania and Bulgaria, it's not like they really had a choice. There were puppet governments installed in all of those places that remained loyal to the Soviet Stalinist government. Stalin dies in 1953, by the way. So the USSR was supporting communists. One of the first things that we see in terms of the, the United States and the West taking a stand against communists was in Greece and Turkey. And um, President Truman, who had taken over at the tail end of World War II, asked Congress for money to aid the governments of Greece and Turkey to withstand rebel assaults against the attempted communist rebel coups in those places. And this became known as the Truman Doctrine. So when we talk about the Truman Doctrine, it's the idea of the United States providing aid to any free nation that is attempting to fight off communism. So the Truman Doctrine, the idea being that we want to prevent those dominoes from falling. We want to contain the Truman Doctrine is all about the policy of containment. We want to contain the spread of con communism. We don't want to let communism spread outside the boundaries of where the Soviet Union is right now. Following World War II, the USSR makes it a priority to rebuild themselves by setting up a system of satellite states in Eastern Europe that will protect them from um, Western incursions into their territories. So the USSR creates this Warsaw Pact to establish military control over, over its what's sometimes called satellite states. So when we talk about Bulgaria or Czechoslovakia or places like that, they are known as satellite states because they are controlled distantly by Moscow. Economic conditions remained very, very poor in most of these Eastern European nations due to a lack of money for economic development. Remember, even going into World War II, although Russia is now industrialized, they're still nowhere near as advanced as the American military is. Although right after World War II, they do manage to have a, a significant boost to their military technology because they steal technology from the Germans. And the Germans had some of the best technology in World War II. So the Russians take all of the designs for things like German submarines and tanks 
and um, military vehicles and engines, and they start building them to German specifications. And they continue doing that for essentially the next 30 years with almost no real redesigns because remember that in a communist nation, they're not about competition. And there's no real incentive in a communist nation to compete to get to make better products or anything. You're essentially just told what you do. Plus, they're incredibly poor a lot of times. And the money is is frivolously wasted on a bunch of social programs that that prevent the state from being able to create a lot better and more advanced innovative um, technologies and, and new inventions and stuff. And so uh, the, the Soviet Union is using designs from Germany. They steal plans for the atomic bomb and start building atomic bombs and spend tons and tons and tons and tons of money building more and more and more and, and larger and larger and larger uh, atomic weapons. Um, but, but generally speaking, um, you know, their technology remains um, inferior to, for example, the United States military technology by the time that we get to the late 60s and then into the 70s and into the 80s, it gets even worse. So um, military alliances, the lines between the Western Bloc and the Eastern Bloc were formally drawn with NATO. Oh, I guess NATO was um, in 49. Warsaw Pact is the one that was made in 55. And it was designed to protect Eastern Europe from capitalist influence. Remember that um, also one of the reasons that the Eastern states tend to fall behind in rebuilding after World War II is because the Soviet Union does not care about Poland. They don't care about Czechoslovakia. They don't care about Bulgaria. They don't care about Hungary. They let all of those places continue to be bombed out messes. And they take every red cent that they have and try and spend it on themselves to rebuild Russia. That's really priority number one for Stalin. Rebuild Russia. Now, America didn't face any attacks during the war. And so because America doesn't have any real um, um, things to, you know, any real destruction in their own cities, they're able to take the money that they make from the war and invest it in Western Europe to build very, very powerful allies in NATO. Okay, uh, so a satellite nation is basically an independent nation that is effectively dominated by another nation and virtually all the members of that Warsaw Pact, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Bulgaria, etc., were basically just satellite states of Russia. They had to run by all of their decisions with the, Mos uh, with the Soviets in Moscow before they could actually be implemented. So in effect, they're basically just provinces of the Soviet Union that the Soviet Union didn't even have to directly administer. Almost think of it kind of like, um, like their colonial assets or something like that, like back in the olden days with Africa or, or South Asia and European nations. Now, here's a map to demonstrate to you it, you know, we often think of the globe in terms of north, south, east, west, and we have a very uh, um, linear way of looking at the globe on flat surfaces. But if you just take that camera and rotate it up here, you can see that really, to be honest with you, the United States and Soviet territory may not be quite as far away from one another as you think they are. Um, after all, Alaska is American territory. And uh, if you if you look at where Alaska is, on the surface of the globe comparative to where the Soviet Union is. And this is kind of a distorted image here, which I apologize for. But you can see that the fastest route to send missiles isn't going to be to send them across the Atlantic this way and then up over here. It's going to be to send them right over the Arctic Ocean, right over into Moscow territory, or even into Eastern Soviet Union territory over here. But all the major populous areas of the Soviet Union are in the western side of the Soviet Union, which is concerning because you know, <clears throat> the Western Soviet Union isn't so far away from places like France, uh, England, and so on. And so we actually ended up building missile sites in various places. Turkey receives aid from us and is part of NATO. So Turkey is allied with the United States during the Cold War. We have missile installations here that can reach out and touch Moscow pretty easily. But even if we needed to send missiles from ships or something like that later on you could have ships stationed all over the place and send missiles from an undisclosed location in the middle of the indian ocean here and and have it hit within you know a couple of inches of where you want it to 
So um, it's it, you know we're we're in a place where the world is. It's a scary place. The Soviet Union's really um, or the uh, excuse me the Cold War is a really freaky time. Uh, where there's a lot of people who live with a whole lot of fear that nuclear disaster could be right around the corner. Um, when I when my mom was a kid, they used to do like you know uh, duck and cover drills, not for earthquakes, but for nuclear bomb attacks. And it's amazing to think that like you know oh, <laughs> a nuclear bomb's been dropped. Get under your desk as if that would do anything, right? I mean you'd just be turned into dust if it was you know dropped close enough. So, um, or, or, you know, like radiation, like let's say it was dropped far enough away where you don't just instantly turn into particulate. All right. It, you know, it's not like your desk is going to do anything to stop radiation poisoning from happening or burns from happening or something like that. So it's kind of a preposterous measure, but it's those things that kids start doing in classrooms just to make people feel like they might be safe. I don't know. 1947 to 1951, due to the Marshall Plan, which is a very significant financial aid plan, uh, where the United States provided $9.4 billion in economic assistance, Western Europe is able to rebuild themselves after World War II on American dollars. And this aid was provided also in part so that the Western European nations could also resist the pull of communism because the harder people's lives are, the more they want the government to help them out. And communism starts to become more and more and more appealing when your life is so miserable. So the United States gives a whole bunch of money uh, in economic assistance after the war to do three things, help them rebuild, help them resist communism, and three, help them to, you know, gain or help the United States have some really reliable friends who appreciate United States um, financial assistance. And here you have a political cartoon, American biased political cartoon, where you have the Marshall Plan over here, you have this nice tractor and so on. And on one side of the fence, which is, of course, analogous to the Iron Curtain. And then over here, you have Stalin explaining to his people with some guy using a plow shaped as a sickle and hammer. Oh, it's the same thing without any mechanical problems, right? Well, obviously, it's not going to be the same thing because the Soviet Union is a total wreck after the S Second World War. And um, the, the Marshall Plan over down here, they call it the Marshall-Stalin Plan, meaning like Marshall is almost like field marshal, like a military title. Okay, so the Stalin plan, this guy has a yoke on him and he's um, pulling this sickle and hammer plow. And you can see everybody here is pretty desperate and, um, and downtrodden. Whereas in the West, they have all this money that they're using for building nice machines and rebuilding West Germany and stuff like that. Even to this day, Eastern Germany is still very, very, very downtrodden compared to Western Germany, despite the fact that there's, they've been one nation now for 30 years. Um, the, there, there have been a lot of, of problems from having separated Germany into two different countries for about 45 years. And, um, and even today, that they still feel the downtrodden nature, the... the uh, of the communist influence that that permeated East Germany for that five decades, four and a half decades, um, it's they're still not all the way recovered. And anyone from Western Germany will tell you the same thing that Eastern Germany fall lags behind. They're less cosmopolitan. It's less populous. There's less jobs there. There's more unemployment. There's more problems with economics and drugs and theft and other things like that. So even to this day, Eastern Germany has problems comparative to Western Germany. And here you can see a visual representation of where the vast majority of the dollars went across Europe. Obviously, a significant amount of money to France and England. A lot of it went to Italy. A lot of it goes to West Germany and the Dutch Republic over here, the Netherlands. But then, too, we see some money going over to Greece, Turkey, Austria to help them prevent the pull of, of uh, communism. And then up here in Scandinavia as well in Norway and Sweden. So the Marshall Plan aid was used to provide financial underpinnings for post-war economic recovery and the expansion of Western Europe. And this growth from the Marshall Plan lasts for like 20 some years uh, because that money, they it just it builds on itself. So they continue to rebuild and regrow for about 20 years or so after the war using Marshall Plan dollars.
And with that, that's where I'm going to leave off for today. Um, I'll be putting up an assignment on Schoology in a, in a little bit, but I'm going to cut my lecture short today because I actually have to set some things up um, with my AP Research kids and do some other things today. Uh, so I've got kind of a lot of things going on. But um, that kind of gets us started on the Cold War, and uh, and I'll I'll try and get an assignment up for you um, shortly. I'm gonna have to come up with something because I don't have much to to just throw onto the thing. So um, anyway, if you have any questions, of course, feel free to uh, reach out to me and say hello and ask your questions, and uh, you know. Uh, let's see here. <laughs> don't go, please. Who is LO mate? Who is that? I don't even know who that is.
don't have them. I don't know what to tell you, man. I don't have the test corrections. I don't know what to say. You know, it's not just, look, I'm just going to explain this because I, look, I don't have, <laughs> Josh, and this goes for everyone. It's like, I, I've, I've said this so many times. I cannot tell you how many people have done test corrections since this whole COVID thing that were late work. And I'm starting to get frustrated because it's like, I don't have them. I don't have the program on my computer to open up the tests. I don't have the files of the tests. I don't have the keys for the tests. I don't have the actual physical test corrections. I don't know what you want me to do about them because I cannot put them into the gradebook. I don't know what else to say about it. I've added everything that I can, you know, like, I, and it's frustrating because I want to help. I'm a person who likes to help my students, but I cannot help you on this scenario. So I don't know what else to tell you about it other than it's missing, you know? And the other part about it is your IEP would be negated by the fact that I've given you so many opportunities for the last three weeks now to do different um, assignments and stuff. And, and the assignment, if you were to add together all the points, test corrections are worth 20 points, 20 points out of your grade, 20 measly points, right? And I've, and I've given 30 points a week for the last three weeks. So I don't understand why there's any complaint at all about not adding work when I've given you guys so many opportunities to get your grade up. And so it's frustrating to me. I'm like really frustrated by being, I don't want to be asked a single other question about test corrections because I've explained this so many times now. So I don't know what to tell you, man. It's okay. I just, I'm sorry, but I just can't do anything about it. That's the thing. That's all it comes down to. So, all right, cool. All right, guys, have a nice day. I got to go.